right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our fourth week of our Crop Hour webinar series. Um, for anyone new here, my name is Shelby Pritchard. I am currently the IPM specialist here at SDSU, and I will be the moderator for the webinar series. Um, and once again, I appreciate all of you taking time this morning to be here with us today. Just a couple of quick reminders. Um, like the intro slide said, feel free to ask any questions throughout the presentation. We'd love to answer them for you. Um, I will pull up a CCA credit at the end of the talk today for everyone who needs that. And there will also be a short poll with a couple of questions that will just take a second of your time. And we ask that you please fill it out. Um, today, we just have one speaker. Um, that is Dr. Adam Barenhorst. Um, he got his master's in entomology from Iowa State University, as well as his PhD in entomology from Iowa State University. Um, and then from August 2015 until now, he has been our extension entomology specialist here at South Dakota State University. And today, Adam will be talking about South Dakota wheat update from 2021. So with that, Adam, go ahead and take it away. All right. Well, thanks, Shelby. And thank you all for joining in today. As Shelby mentioned, I'm going to be talking about some of the wheat insects we saw last year. And uh, if you were paying attention to the season last year, it was actually pretty, pretty slow year for wheat insect issues uh, until the grasshoppers started to show up. So uh, without further ado, we'll get started. And let's talk about those first. Uh, I talked about grasshoppers uh, for every one of these talks I've given and every other talk I've given this year. And the reason for that is, is we may be looking at some grasshopper issues as we move into the 2022 season. And we probably saw some grasshopper issues at the end of 2021, especially uh, for areas where that winter wheat was starting to emerge and grasshoppers happened to also be in those areas. And so if we think back, uh, we had grasshopper issues in 2021. We know that there were areas when we were out scouting, we saw large populations. We had reports of very large populations. If we look back to 2020, we had a very favorable fall in 2020. We had a later frost. It was pretty warm. And if we think back, I know it's hard to believe it's two years already, 2020, uh, we had some really large grasshopper populations that year as well. We had reports of trees being defoliated in central South Dakota. We had reports of, you know, fields uh, that were starting to be removed uh, due to the defoliation. And so we know that the grasshopper populations have been uh, kind of trending upwards for the last few years. And if we think about last season, in addition to already having some larger grasshopper populations, possibly just from the year before that, we also had a really dry season with a lot of severe drought or moderate uh, drought throughout the season in a lot of different locations. And if we look at the pictures down here, these are kind of our main culprits in South Dakota for, uh, excuse me, grasshopper pop, uh, population issues. And if we go from left to right, these are differential grasshoppers. It's kind of hard to tell in the pictures because I, I, tried to size them so they're easy to see some of the details, but uh, the differential and the two striped, which is over here, are going to be the largest ones that you're going to see in large numbers out in the field. Uh, the body size is going to be much larger. This guy in the middle is the red-legged grasshopper, and they're actually quite a bit smaller than the other two species. Now, when we're trying to point out some key characteristics besides size, because there can be a lot of variation within uh, season just due to what they're feeding on and a few other factors. Differential grasshoppers will have these black chevrons, the markings here on this hind leg. Uh, and that is actually one of the main characteristics we look for. They're going to have kind of a green uh, body that can vary a little bit. There are some for these two species, some very unique variations that are very uncommon where they can be completely different color. We don't talk about that much because they're, like I said, pretty uncommon. But for the most part, this is what the differential grasshoppers will look like. The next one is the red-legged. As I mentioned, these are smaller. And if you look right here, you can imagine where they got their name. They have red uh, hind legs. And so that's 
pretty much their key characteristic. Now, there's another species called the migratory grasshopper, and they're pretty similar. However, we did a survey a few years ago in South Dakota, and we found that instead of migratory grasshoppers being the uh, species that was predominant for the smaller one, it was actually red leg. And we've seen that now in the last couple of years as well. Uh, in an, our neighboring state, Montana, uh, they had huge population issues with this guy right here, the red-legged. And so some of that kind of started moving into our northwestern corner, but something we'll continue to monitor. But uh, one of those species to really watch for. And the last one here is the two-stripe grasshopper. And it gets its name because of these lines that start on its head and then converge kind of towards the end of its wings. But uh, that's where it gets its name. So those are the three we watch for. And if we think back to 2020, I said we had some fields that had major issues from grasshoppers. And this is actually some of our sunflower research plots. And this was uh, this was at Dakota Lakes Research Farm. And this was soybean. What happened was we found out some uh, grass had been sprayed over here. It had been harboring a very large population of grasshoppers. And then they moved out of that area and they were looking for anything green. And it's actually a great example. Uh, at the time we were a little disappointed, but it ended up being a great, great teaching lesson. So we lost the sunflower plots and this is within a week. So one week we were out and they looked fine. The next week they looked like they got hailed out. You can kind of see it in cell phone pictures, not hundred percent clarity kind of see something right there. Well, if we zoom in, we had two striped grasshoppers just covering these plants. And in another week, the heads were gone too. And so it really went to show how fast those populations can move. So when food becomes unavailable in one area, these grasshoppers will move out and search for whatever food they can find. And if there are large populations, they will move kind of in mass and search that food out and then completely destroy whatever they find. And so when we talk about large populations, that's what we're referring to, uh, those populations that just completely decimate anything in their path. And so let's think about the weather conditions from last year. So I mentioned it was dry, but how dry? Well, it was extremely dry. The red here is extreme drought. You see there's variations of drought throughout most of the state, but as the season progressed, we saw that maybe in some areas, the drought monitor said it was reduced impact to other areas it increased. The key though, is that throughout this season, it was pretty dry. And in the fall, some areas started getting moisture. But even as we ended the season, I just looked, I didn't put the new drought monitor. It's already showing that we're still really dry, uh, the winter drought monitor map. And we think we, you know, we've had a little bit of snow, but for South Dakota, we've actually at this point probably are a uh, little behind snowfall. Maybe Laura Edwards will talk about that when uh, she has her talk coming up. But, you know, when we think about things as we move forward to this, uh, this upcoming spring, if we're starting dry, that means if we have any crops that do emerge, those are going to be probably what's green right away in the spring. Uh, and those might actually be kind of a target. Another thing we have to think about from 2021 is when was our first hard frost? I said that the first hard frost back in 2020 was kind of late. Well, it was kind of late in 2021 as well. So if we look here, all the different colors refer to the different dates of the first hard frost. And so the light blue here represents uh, end of September. So we go through the greens, dark greens, early October, light greens, end of October, and then uh, the kind of tan brown colors uh, early November. So at the exception of this one area here in South Dakota, we actually were pushed into uh, mid in some areas to late October and in some other parts of the state, we are actually into the first week of November. That's about two to three weeks behind schedule. And that might not seem like a lot, but when we're talking about these grasshoppers that are going to be out in the environment pretty much until that first hard frost, what happens is the longer they're able to be active, the more successful they are in laying eggs. And the more successful they are in laying eggs, the greater the population is going to be the next spring. And so some factors historically that have been looked at in terms of what can reduce a grasshopper population in the spring then, well, one of the things might be precipitation. 
But if we're already looking at a pretty dry spring, we're not going to have a lot of snow melt. Maybe it's hard to say we're just entering February today. Maybe we'll see a ton of snow in February, but I've heard some reports that it might be kind of dry. And so if it is, and we don't get a lot of moisture around the time those grasshoppers are starting to emerge, we're going to reduce the likelihood of drowning some of those out. And so if we have a very successful emergence, we could be looking at some more issues moving into the next year, 2022. So as I mentioned, the 2021 drought, the late frost this last fall, we're probably going to see some grasshopper population problems in 2022. Now, I don't have a crystal ball, so I can't point and say this is exactly where in the state we're going to see a problem. Uh, we probably will start this year again doing our grasshopper scouting just to try to stay on top of where some of those populations may be showing up. And I know I'm not going to talk about it too much today because blister beetles aren't an issue for wheat, but when we have our alfalfa talk that Patrick Wagner will be giving, it'll import, be important if you grow alfalfa to tune into that because one of the things that we know that happens with grasshopper populations is that if you have a large population of grasshoppers, the following year, you're likely to have a large population of blister beetles. And so he'll talk about that more though. Uh, I believe that may be uh, next week or the week after, but when he's covering alfalfa, uh, that'll be something important to consider. And so we're really going to be dependent on spring conditions uh, to see whether or not we, we may see some reductions in these grasshopper populations. But if we think about thresholds for adults, it's eight to 14 grasshoppers per square yard. For nymphs, it's 30 to 45. So pretty dramatic increase if you're looking at nymphs. We actually want to try to manage the grasshoppers when they're young. The reason for that is they're easier to kill. And you can use uh, the medium rate, higher rate still on the label, but you'll have more success in killing the nymphs than the adults. Foliar insecticides, if uh, we're talking about this spring for winter wheat are our best option. If we're worried about spring wheat that's emerging, we can use insecticide seed treatments that will slow down grasshopper feeding. Now it won't kill them, but it'll deter them to some extent. The same thing for these insecticide seed treatments when we're thinking about winter wheat planting in the fall, we can use those and slow down the grasshopper feeding. Another thing that we recommend if we know there's going to be a problem is actually planting a higher density of seeds around the field margins. A lot of times those grasshoppers are going to be moving in from road ditches or other fields. And so if you have a higher planting population right around the edge of the field, they'll hit that. They are going to feed there, but there's a likelihood that they won't completely remove the uh, stand. And so you'll be able to still have wheat in that area. So uh, however, a lot of times if we at, are at that point where we need to plant a higher planting population just to keep some wheat out in the field, we're probably also using foliar insecticides because we're probably well above these thresholds. Well, this is a question we had last year. Uh, somebody mentioned that they have tons of weevils on their wheat at harvest. And so the two culprits could be the rice weevil or the maize weevil. The rice weevil has, uh, they're both very small. So here's a reference, one millimeter. So you can imagine they're about three to four millimeters long. So pretty small. The rice weevil will have a shorter snout. Both the adults and the larvae will feed on the developing seeds. The rice weevils are not strong flyers. So they have to get out into an area and they'll probably stay in the area. Their life cycle requires a high moisture content. So if you see these in a storage area, it means that you have a lot of humidity. Uh, we just put an article out recently on the extension website, cold temperatures that we've been going off and on with. I know we haven't had real constant cold temperatures. It seems like we seem to kind of be on a roller coaster trend, but when it's cold, if you have a fan or able to, able to have any uh, aeration in the bin, it's a good idea to use that this time of year when it's cold. It will maybe dry out the seeds a little bit, but my point is we can keep that humidity level in a storage area down with cold air. It'll cool the grain, it'll dry the air out a little bit, and that can help. The other weevil is the maize weevil. Now these are small, they also have a shorter snout. 
the adults and larvae will feed. These are strong flyers. So if we're seeing these out in the field, there's a chance that they could be the maize weevils. Uh, they could also be the rice weevils, but chances are they're the maize weevils. And what can we do? Well, for management, one of the things that's recommended in looking up this issue is actually using a grain cleaner. And so if you know you have an infestation in the field when you're harvesting, you're noticing a lot of weevils, it's probably a good idea to run that grain through a grain cleaner to try to remove some of the weevils before you put it in the storage. Another thing you consider is a pre-bin treatment uh, where you would spray the actual walls of the bin with malathion or another product that's labeled for that. And something that's probably the best option if you already know you have an infestation is using protectant insecticide that's applied at the auger. So anything you can do because once those weevils are on the grain, they're going to stay with the grain unless we remove them and then they'll become an issue in the storage area. So that's enough on those weevils. Now let's move to cutworms. Now, each year we see army cutworm moths in the spring. These actually are uh, late in the fall. They hatch, they feed on our winter wheat a little bit in the fall. They overwinter as the caterpillars. Then in the spring, they emerge, they feed some more and then pupate and we get the moths. For a couple of years, I had reports of army cutworm issues, but that seems to have gone down. However, army cutworms can show up in large populations, so it's not uncommon. And if they do, they can cause a lot of defoliation. One of the big differences between the army cutworm and the pale western cutworm is where they're feeding. So army cutworms will feed on the upper parts of the plant. If you remove the population, the wheat typically will uh, be able to compensate for that feeding and you'll still get a pretty good crop. Now, I have not had any reports really of the pale western cutworm since I've been here, but it can be in South Dakota. Big differences is these will feed above the soil line. These will feed below the soil line. So these are feeding on the growing points uh, below soil. And if they do that, they will actually kill the plant. And so between these two for management, it's much easier to manage army cutworms. You just have to make sure that they're not hiding under the debris in the soil. So typically we recommend for cutworms to try to spray later in the day uh, just because they'll be emerging as soon as it starts to get dark. For the pale western cutworm, there just isn't as much management, but these are more of an issue for spring wheat because they hatch in the spring and don't start really feeding until later in, uh, in June. And so, uh, as I mentioned, army cutworms hatch in winter wheat and alfalfa fields in the fall. They'll feed a little bit, start feeding in the early spring. They can cause some stand losses if there's a lot of feeding and it's not managed. Pale Western cutworms though are more of the issue. And so if you see notice that you have a spring wheat field that seems like you're losing plants, uh, it might be worth doing a little digging around those areas to see if you can find any of the Pale Western cutworm caterpillars. Now the thresholds for these two vary a little bit and that's due to the fact that pale western cutworms are more serious because you can't really save the plants after they're in the field. So for army cutworm, it's two to four caterpillars per square foot. Pale western cutworms are one to two caterpillars per square foot. And for both of these, at this point in time, really our best management strategy is to use a pyrethroid insecticide that's applied later in the evening, if possible, uh, because you wanna try to hit those uh, when they may be right at the soil line for the pale western or for the army cutworm when they are active on the plants. So now we're going to switch gears from caterpillars. We're going to move to aphids. So for aphids, there's really three that we watch for in South Dakota wheat. First are the bird cherry oat aphids. These are going to be kind of an olive green color. And the big characteristic I, I, I like to use when I'm identifying them is this burnt orange patch that's at the end of their body. And that might not look like much in this picture, but when you're out in the field, that will really stick out when you're scouting for aphids because it's a darker colored aphid and that kind of rusty or burnt orange patch will really pop uh, on the plant. Now these migrate to wheat in late spring, early summer, we don't see a ton of these in South Dakota in the last few years. 
uh, when I first showed up in South Dakota, they were uh, kind of showing up. So I don't know if I showed up and scared the aphids away or what was the deal, but uh, we haven't seen a lot of bird cherry oat aphids in South Dakota for the last couple of years. Now, bird cherry oat aphids, as well as the other species, can all vector barley outdoor fires. And so that's one concern we have. Although we don't typically see a lot of issues with barley outdoor fires in South Dakota. And the other issue we have is if we don't manage the populations and they take off, we can actually see large enough populations show up that we actually get yield reductions just through direct feeding. And so that's something we also have to watch for during the season. Another species we watch for are English crane aphids. Now these will also be a fairly large aphid, but some key characteristic differences between them and the bird cherry oat aphids. Number one, they're going to be lighter in color. So they'll be lighter green, kind of a yellow green color. And then they're going to have dark patches on their appendages. So if you look here, the legs have are darker colored towards what we would consider their feet. And then there's a lighter segment and then darker segments. So, so I like to say typically around the joints is where it's a little bit darker. They're going to have their dark uh, colored tailpipes, which will stick out pretty far from their body. And then they're going to have alternating light and dark patterns on their antenna. So those are one, one of the key characteristics for these guys. And they'll, they'll not have an orange patch. So bird cherry oat aphids do. English grain aphids don't have that marking. So we typically see English grain aphids showing up on developing heads. They'll be on the other parts of the plant as well, but they tend to congregate up on the developing heads. They can also vector barley yell dwarf virus, but uh, one of the other issues we have with these again is direct feeding can be an issue, especially since uh, these have that tendency to be up on the head. They can uh, cause more issues with that. And so the last species of aphid are green bug. And I've only seen these out in the field one time in South Dakota. Again, they can bar, uh, be a vector of barley all dwarf fires or reduce yield just by having large populations. They're going to be a light green aphid, smaller than the other two species. But the characteristic here isn't so much their coloration. It's what they're going to leave on the leaves that they're feeding on. When they feed on a leaf, they're going to inject their saliva. The saliva is going to cause a disruption in the cells, and it's going to leave behind this kind of a rusty patch or a darker patch. But you can see here on the field, any and on the field on this leaf here, anywhere they fed, uh, it's actually discolored, and so that's a characteristic for green bug. So what do we do if we we need to scout for aphids? Well, one of the things I recommend every year is actually go out and scout. I know we do have some prophylactic treatments in South Dakota going on for aphids and wheat. If you don't have a large population of the aphids, it's not worth spraying. The reason for that is there are going to be the other insects. I know we talk about this a lot, but those natural enemies, the predators that feed on aphids, if they're out in the field and you have a few aphids, they're probably going to keep that population fairly low. However, if we go and spray, one of the issues we can see is that we've removed all of those predators that were feeding on the aphids. And maybe you didn't remove all of the aphids or maybe the aphids come back in from the neighbor's field. Well, now there's nothing in your field to feed on them. And so in some cases, we actually see the populations take off and then you have to retreat. But if you're scouting, we recommend walking, starting on one side of the field, and kind of walk in a zigzag or Z or W pattern throughout the field and randomly stop. I typically stop uh, when I hit kind of the points where I'm turning and examine plants. And so for management for aphids, we typically recommend preventing the green bridge. So don't have volunteer wheat, or if you can, don't have other grasses because some of those will be alternative hosts for these aphid species. Something else you can do is delay planting. So uh, I mentioned they show up kind of, some of the species show up at different times. So delaying planting, especially in the fall, can actually help you because they'll move to other fields. Delaying the planting in the spring may actually lead to more infestation from bird cherry oat aphids. So it's kind of tricky. 
Another thing with delaying planting, I say this all the time is I hate to be the guy that tells you to delay planting. And then you do that to try to avoid the aphids. And then it doesn't stop raining, which is, would be really nice this year. But if you can't get the seed in the ground, you're not really going to be able to take advantage of rains. Seed treatments can be very effective for managing aphids and wheat. So uh, in some cases, we say that maybe they're not the best option, but for aphids and wheat, especially for winter wheat, uh, it can be very effective at reducing the populations in the fall. And what happens a lot of times in the fall is we have populations that have built up in other crops throughout the season, and they'll kind of move around. So a lot of times, they might move out of small grains into a cornfield and then out of the cornfield as it senesces back into winter wheat as it starts to green up. By using seed treatments, we can reduce the populations that are moving into those uh, newly emerging crops. Foliar insecticides are also an option. We've had some studies the last few, probably the last four years, and we haven't seen a lot of benefit from foliar insecticides, but as I mentioned, we also haven't had a lot of aphids. And so you need aphids to really see the benefit of those. Whoops. And so uh, this table here just shows the rough thresholds for the different aphid species through the different stages. I like to point out that for green bug, the thresholds are typically higher. They also typically stay the same, uh, pretty consistent throughout the growth. So about 25 green bugs per plant, and that's a field average. So you need to look at more than just one plant that's infested. For bird cherry oat aphids, it varies a little bit. As we get later into the wheat uh, growth stages, you'll notice the thresholds for both the bird cherry oat and the English grain aphids go down. And that's because those are larger aphids. If they feed heavily on the plant, they can reduce yield. And so that's kind of what we're looking at. But I know typically it's somewhere right around here, maybe getting into the flowering stage is when we see some applications go out for insecticides in the uh, spring here, uh, it's coming up. And a lot of times I, I don't know if those are really warranted. So kind of my plea to you is if you are going to be potentially spraying wheat, make please make sure you actually have the aphids out there before you spray. Now this next pest is the true army worm. And it's pretty much been an issue every year since uh, before I even started here in South Dakota. I actually was here in July of 2015 for an interview. I happened to be walking past Paul Johnson's office and he goes, oh, are you the guy that's interviewing for the entomology position? I said, yeah. And he goes, what do you do for true army worm and wheat? And I had no idea that that was going to be something that stuck around. Uh, and every year about in July is when these show up. They have to migrate from the southern U.S., and they typically show up as we're getting towards the end of the season, which can cause some issues because we've seen in the last few years, we've seen fields that get heavily defoliated by these guys, almost completely removes areas of the field. Uh, also, though, they can cause some other feeding issues later in the season. But how do we identify them? Well, we can't really go on color because they can vary pretty significantly from one caterpillar to another in the same field in what they look like as far as color. But you'll notice there's some characteristics that even though this one's dark green and this one's kind of a tan color that stay the same. And one of them is this orange line right here on the side of the body. You'll notice it's in all the pictures where I have the side included. So that's one key characteristic you can look for. The other is if you happen to be able to see the uh, pro legs. So these are the true legs right here. These are the four pro legs. They'll have a black line on them, but you can see a lot of times you can't really see that, especially if they're curling up. Uh, so not always the easiest to find. The easiest by far besides the orange stripe is the head. So it's going to be an orange head capsule. It's kind of hard to see in these, but you can see it a little bit. It's always going to have this network of kind of scribbled black lines on it. I like to tell people, it looks like somebody took an ink pen and just started drawing on their head and kind of drawing weird little circles. And that's kind of the best characteristic we can look for for the true army worm. And so, as I mentioned, these will feed on the leaves. We can see yield loss if we have destruction in the flag leaf. 
the other issue is since these are showing up typically sometime in July, a lot of times towards the end of July, depending on when we have our strong southerly winds in the summer, they may show up around the time that the wheat's starting to uh, mature and they'll clip the heads off. And armyworms get their names because they'll move in large populations from one field to the next. And so you can imagine if you have a large population of these caterpillars feeding through a field and then they start clipping heads, you can have a lot of yield loss happen pretty quickly. And so it is important to stay on top of these. And since we know about when they're going to show up, we typically try to stay on top of it as far as uh, us scouting and putting out recommendations if it's time to scout or maybe a time to consider treating. But it's something that we do need to watch for pretty much every year, it seems like. So for management of these, we scout typically using visual counts. I use a sweep net. So the threshold is two caterpillars per square yard if you're standing and you're estimating a square yard in the field. Uh, and we've converted that to about 40 caterpillars per 30 pendulum sweeps. So the pendulum sweep is when you go back and forth. That counts as one sweep. Now, since these typically are showing up later in the season, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, well, what can we spray that won't delay harvest? Because you have to remember, insecticides have that pre-harvest interval. And a lot of our insecticides have somewhere in the 20 to 30 day range pre-harvest interval. So if you're close to harvest and you spray something like that, legally you have to wait 30 days before you can harvest the field. Um, there are some products though that I listed here and these aren't endorsements. These are just the products that I was able to pull out that had some of the shortest pre-harvest intervals. So Bolton has a seven day pre-harvest interval and they, it, these are labeled for true armyworm in wheat. And then Corrigin or Prevathin, these have the same active ingredient, have one day. So if you have true armyworm show up and you're not too far out from harvest, but you start to notice head clipping occurring, these would kind of be your best bets for reducing those populations, prevent the head clipping, but also not delay harvest by very much. So next we're going to switch wheat curl mite. Uh, we get questions about this every year. Uh, Connie will be handling uh, the other side of the wheat curl mite, which is a disease, but they're, ve they're very small. We typically recommend carrying a hand lens just to see them. You still won't be able to see them very well. There are these little white, we say they're cigar shaped uh, specimens here on this leaf. So this is magnified quite a bit. The adults are so small that they're actually carried on the wind. They don't fly, they get blown around and they overwinter on green plant material. So you can probably guess where I'm going. Best way to manage wheat curl mites is to prevent a green bridge from happening. And that green bridge is where you have a volunteer plant that's infested, and then you happen to plant wheat nearby. And with these guys, it can be fairly far away, but if it's in the same field, it's a very high likelihood of having them move into the new field, uh, the new stand. And so we try to reduce that. And uh, Connie won't be speaking today, but the disease that these uh, transmit is wheat streak mosaic virus. And so Having these is typically the indicator that you're going to have the disease and vice versa. If you have the disease, it was an indicator that you had the wheat chromite. And I get asked a lot, can we spray them? What can we do? And unfortunately, they're small enough and they're tough enough that spraying doesn't really do anything for them. And so one of the options is delay planting. The other is to remove the green bridge. And those are really our best options for wheat chromites. Now, since I've been here in South Dakota, I've seen years where these just decimate fields. Uh, and so they show up and then they transmit the virus and that just can destroy a field. So it's something to really consider uh, when you're thinking about what you need to do for management. And especially since our best options are delaying planting or just making sure we don't have anything that can be a alternative host for these guys in the field. So a few other things uh, that have been showing up, they're kind of odd, uh, wasn't last year, it was uh, 2020, we had slugs in wheat. Now this is first time I've ever had this uh, reported to me. I don't know if we'll even have to worry about it. Depending on the spring conditions, these may or may not show up and be an issue. 
That's because slugs require cool, wet conditions. They need to be in an area with high crop residues. They're typically in the field because there are high crop residues. So typically in no-till fields, which that's not the problem because typically they don't move up the plants and start feeding on them. But if they do, it's because there's a lot of moisture and they're more of a spring issue. And as you'll see here in this picture, they move up on the plants and then they start to scrape the foliage with their mouth parts. And as they do, they kind of damage the plants. There are other states, uh, Pennsylvania has a lot of issues with slugs and other crops. We typically don't in South Dakota because it's typically on the drier side and slugs don't do as well on our crops. And so if you have a lot of slugs, they can reduce stands. They can also, by just feeding on the plants, but they can also feed on germinating seeds. And so it's something to watch for. At this point in time, don't really have a good management solution to these. And part of that's just because they're so unusual. Another pest we see every year, but is always a minor pest, is the wheat stem maggot. When you have these out in the field, you're going to get these uh, bleached white heads. And if you have the bleached white heads, it can be due to wheat stem maggots or a disease. The easiest way to tell the difference between the insect pest and the disease is you grab the plant about here and you give it a tug upwards. If it's due to wheat stem maggot, the stem will easily pull out. When you look at the bottom of it, you'll see some obvious uh, indications that it was fed on. Well, that's from the larvae of this pest. When the larvae feed down on the, that part of the stem, they actually are going to kill the head because now nutrients and water aren't moving upwards. And that's why it turns white. That's also why you can pull it out because that part of the head's been completely removed uh, or stem, I mean, so the head's not really attached to anything. And so when you pull up, there's nothing to give you resistance. The next couple of two pests, I guess I have left are Hessian fly, and then uh, wheat, wheat stem sawfly. The reason I'm including these is for the last few years for hessian fly, I've been getting reports of potential hessian fly infestations in central South Dakota. So I figured it's time we start talking about these and how we can stop having these uh, fields that are infested. So the hessian fly adults are pretty small. They're about an eighth of an inch long. They're dark in color. And this is what they look like. And they also, they have these bead-like antenna, which we say can help identify them because there are going to be a lot of flies out in a wheat field, especially in the spring. And so the adults emerge in the spring in South Dakota, they can vary depending on the season, maybe have one to three generations. That last generation probably won't be complete. So typically one to two full generations in South Dakota. For the hessian fly, once the flies emerge, they're going to be out in the field. The females will lay eggs on the upper side of the upper leaves. Uh, and so it'll be these tiny little orange specks. So they're kind of longer than they are wide, but it will actually be in the leaf ridges. And so very small. So you really need to be on top of your scouting game and have a hand lens probably to see these. And the egg laying can actually happen pretty uh, shortly after plant emergence. So they're hatching and the plants are emerging typically at about the same time. After the larvae hatch, they're also going to be fairly small and orange. Uh, but when the larvae reach their kind of last stage before they uh, go into their puparium, they'll be about a quarter of an inch long. And that's what the larvae look like towards the end. And so they'll become translucent and kind of have a green stripe on the back of their bodies. So these are maggots. They don't look like a lot. And a lot of times we probably just pass right over those without even noticing them on the plant uh, because they won't be uh, real obvious. They're going to typically be behind the leaf sheath, but they'll always, so they'll start on the top of the plant and they'll start working their way down the plant. These maggots will. And so uh, as they move behind the leaf sheaths, they'll move downwards in the plants. They're going to end up at the soil, uh, soil line kind of at the base of the plant. Uh, and then they're actually going to go below that to overwinter. 
And so what I've gotten reports on though is right here. So we're not seeing the infestation when it's happening so much as we're seeing the evidence of an infestation, which is this flax seed puparium. And you can, if you ever seen flax seed, gets its name because that's what it resembles. Uh, that's kind of the end of the larval life stage. And if the weather conditions are right, the flies will pupate and then emerge. So that's where we can get our next generation. If it's the end of the season though, they'll just hang out uh, below the soil line in this life stage and then emerge in the spring. If you have a very large infestation, you can actually get, uh, in some cases they'll be stacked. So you can have a lot of these flaxseed puparians or lots of larvae as you also see here. So they're kind of in between life stages there, but uh, you have both present but that's an indication of a very severe infestation. Now, if you have a lot of Hessian flies, there are some symptoms that you might see out in the field. One of them is increased tissue growth at the base of the plant. Uh, the reason for that is, is that's where they end up feeding. And like some of our other insects, they'll actually cause nutrients to be drawn to that area so that they can have more food available to them. Another indication that you might have a Hessian fly infestation is the tillers will be stunted and they'll be dark green. So they'll be darker than an uninfested plant. Infested plants will also have leaf blades that are wider and shorter than a healthy plant that's not infested. And you can imagine as the infestation gets worse, we'll have dieback and then a really bad infestation will also result in thin plant stands out in the field. So to manage these, there are resistant wheat varieties. However, uh, most of the literature will tell you that there are also biotypes of the Hessian fly. So uh, like we've had for other pests like the soybean aphid, as we look at these resistant lines, sometimes the pest overcomes a resistant variety. And so we say that's a biotype. So all their other alternatives, crop rotation. So we do that in South Dakota. One of the big ones is remove volunteer wheat we have to destroy the green bridge. At least one year when this was reported to me, it was reported from a volunteer wheat plant from out in the field. So it's very important to make sure you don't have volunteer wheat out in the field because that can be a target for maybe not the first population from the overwintering, but the next generation may target that. And so we, we don't want that to happen. Seed treatments can reduce hessian fly populations. Foliar insecticides can be somewhat effective if they're applied right after weed emergence. Uh, so that's kind of when we're worried about the Hessian flies moving in. Uh, but the other thing we can do is plant after fly free dates. So uh, in the past, when these were such a major issue for wheat, uh, researchers determined when the flies actually are emerging and when it's safe to plant winter wheat in pretty much from south to north in the United States. In South Dakota, we're pretty much looking at mid to early September. So if you're further south in the state, that means your planting date's going to be later than if you're further north. Uh, so when I say mid-September, it would vary. I believe that when I was looking at the map, it was from the 12th to the 17th as you were moving kind of north. So you can imagine if you're in uh, counties that are close to the border, you're probably even looking closer to end of August. Uh, so... Uh, the border with North Dakota, that is. So it's just one of the things to consider. But since we have been getting reports, it is important to remember that we can still have Hessian fly issues. We just typically don't have as many issues as states further south do. And then the other pests that I've been hearing a little bit about here in the state, uh, they can be in South Dakota. If they are in South Dakota, there are two areas of the state that they're probably most likely in. One would be the northwestern corner uh, that borders Montana because Montana has had issues with these pretty severe issues for quite a while. The other would be in our western counties that are bordering uh, Nebraska. Now, the reason for that is Nebraska did a survey a few years ago and they were seeing uh, Hessian fly populations pretty close to the border. And so those would kind of be the two areas where I would guess we might be seeing, or hash fly, wheat stem soft fly, that is, where we might see some wheat stem soft fly problems in our wheat. 
So if you are concerned that you might have wheat stem sawflies, feel free to get a hold of me during the season. We can come out. They're pretty easy to identify, though. The adults are going to look like a wasp. They're slender. They're going to have black bodies with yellow markings. These won't sting, though. And they'll have long antenna. So that's, uh, if you notice, the antenna are pretty long and straight. I've been told that when they're kind of flying around looking for plants to lay eggs on, sometimes they're almost like small, um, can be almost mistaken for like a small butterfly. They're less than an inch long. The females will be a little bit larger than the males. They aren't strong flyers, so that might make you think, well, they can't really probably move easily from field to field, but they can get moved on wind. So the wind can assist in moving them around a little bit. One of the issues, we always like to say that Insects have short emergence periods, but these can actually have a pretty long emergence period from when they start to when they finish. And so that means it makes it very hard to manage them using insecticides. And so typically in South Dakota, we'd be looking at somewhere from mid to late June for emergence to start, and it could go probably well into July. And so the adults are going to, the females will lay the eggs into the wheat stem and they aren't the major issue though. The adults aren't going to actually cause any feeding in injury to the plants. It's going to be the larvae, the maggots that we worry about. Uh, the larvae here uh, will feed inside the stem. And as they're feeding, if you're dissecting stems and catch a live larvae, uh, they're going to have a kind of characteristic S shape. That's how they're moving through the plant. So they kind of brace themselves as they're uh, pushing their way downwards. And so they'll have an S shape. Uh, these can vary quite a bit. This is a later stage. Uh, the earlier stages will uh, not be quite as large, obviously, and they'll also be lighter, almost translucent, yeah, especially if you catch them right after they hatch. As they move downwards, so they'll start and kind of feed their way down, they're going to go towards the soil line and about an inch or two above the soil surface, they're going to notch the inside of the stem. So they'll feed around it and then they create a chamber below the notch. And they do that so that they have a nice safe place to overwinter. They plug up the top of uh, the stem where they're going to be hiding under, and they make sure that it's a nice safe place. And so this is what that looks like. So if you see plants out in the field, you have lodging and you see that the plants look like they were essentially clipped, probably a pretty good indicator of wheat stem sawfly being out in the field. And so if you see this, you have an infestation pretty much guaranteed, uh, especially if you split these open. So you can kind of see the plug right there. If you split these open, you should be able to find uh, evidence of the larvae or the larvae down below there. Now, with wheat stem sawfly, I don't get a lot of reports of this here in the state. It's possible that it's out there, but... Feeding can reduce the yield somewhere around 20%. Big issue is they can cause a lot of lodging. And so field infestations can reach 70 to 80% on a bad year. If you think about 70 to 80% of the field being lodged, that sounds like a, a real headache. Uh, so other states have you know, reported that you can still harvest the field even when it's severely lodged, but you have to run the head right against the soil. And so, so, you know, that can lead to some issues as well. And you're still not going to recover all of the wheat doing that either. So what can we do to manage wheat stem sawfly? Well, one of the big things is crop rotation. However, there's always probably going to be wheat in the neighborhood. So that won't completely remove the issue. Another thing is delay planting a little bit so that you avoid when that emergence is occurring. Uh, and a lot of the recommendations talk about kind of going through and swathing an early harvest. And that's so that you can prevent lodging, uh, try to get ahead of it. One of the things with that is if you do decide to do that because you know you have an infested field, it's recommended that you go about halfway up the plant and that's uh, leave leave kind of this much, somewhere this, this much plant uh, out in the field yet. Whole reason for that is the larvae are still going to be in that stem but there are parasitoid wasps that will attack them. And if you completely remove the larvae, you're also removing the parasitoid wasps. And so we're not going to have them building up and they can reduce the populations eventually. Another really good thing that's very effective against wheat stem sawfly or solid stem cultivars 
because they can't move down through the stem as easily then. And they really rely on that. So those are kind of uh, the recommendations for those guys. So I have a few slides just for you to look at uh, for the university. These were in the beginning slides as well. And so if you ever need to reach out to me, if you have any of these issues in your wheat, or if you think you may have had an issue with Hessian fly or wheat stem sawfly, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to visit with you about it. Uh, I think we're going to probably, as we move forward into 2022, I think we're going to do some surveying around the state just to see if we can find any evidence of wheat stem sawfly and also the Hessian fly as well. And we're also going to be looking at those fly free dates because uh, you know things change over the years and sometimes it's a good idea to reevaluate, make sure those all still match up uh, for most of the state and put something out for you on those as well. So uh, you can reach me at my office phone number. I'm not there right now due to uh, some construction that's going on in that building. You can also reach me at my email. Uh, during the summer, this is probably your best bet because I'll be out in the field. Or you can reach me at my Twitter. I don't always check Twitter real carefully, though. Uh, occasionally, I'll post stuff. So if you have Twitter and want to follow, feel free to. I'll post articles or uh, kind of put out uh, information if I'm seeing pest populations in the field. So those are the best ways to follow or get a hold of me. So otherwise, if we have no questions today, Shelby, I'll turn it back over to you and you can uh, run the run the final slides and the survey. All right. All right, so both the poll and the CCA credits are up. And I did share a link with you guys um, for the upcoming Agronomy Winter Roadshow dates and information. Um, there is one this Friday in Chamberlain, uh, Friday, February the 4th, um, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the American. So we hope to see you there. And if there are any questions, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A feature. All right, and if there are no questions in, we hope to see you tomorrow where we will be covering um, varieties management and weed control in wheat.